Has Twitter contributed to, uh, to some extent, breaking you? Yeah, De oh, most definitely. No other platform has de yo. You know when they decompartmentalize you, when they break you down to such a point when you're just like, but guys, really, really. <laughs> Introducing the epitome of luxury living, Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits. Richard writes, Eh, hey. it's Peter Yar. Who's who? Petoba these days. Yo, Petoba. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'm like as single as it can get. It's by choice, the lady. Is it? Yeah, it's really by choice. Oh, you, you're that? beautiful. You're doing well. Your career is growing. Um, you worked on your healing this year, so it has to be by choice, surely. Look. <laughs> As much as I'd like to believe it was by choice, I think it's just one of those things where I've tapped into a certain element of my career where people are just really afraid to engage with me. If it's oh, not an intimidation thing, yeah. it's a, oh my God, you do story times, oh, you're going to talk about me. And sure. Yeah, I guess, I think I wanted to date, but it's a good thing that I didn't because I solidified the Nelly M official the, brand. The brand. Right? And you almost solidified it in those critical years of your 20s. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think... If I had dated anybody this year that I would have put as much emphasis, you know, I'm one of those people where if I'm in a relationship, I give my all. Yeah. And a lot of the time I give, I pour from an empty cup. So this time I was pouring back into myself. Yeah. That's how I see it. Yeah. But I'm still single. But then don't you struggle with having to now separate yourself from the brand? Because as you're saying, you've worked so hard to build the brand in yeah. the last three years. Yeah. Now you need to find Naledi Malela again and not Naledi M official. Exactly. It's so hard to disassociate because now the thing is, when you've kind of immersed yourself, it's different when you are playing a character, like let's say acting, ne, where you can be Zinkle on a show, but then when you get off, you're a completely different person. But when your whole life is your career, sure. your real life, it's very hard to disassociate all the time. Like you don't get a chance to breathe. Like you always have to be in a good mood because that's what people see from me constantly. So it's difficult. Um, I'm trying to figure out what I like all over again. I'm trying to tackle the realities of my 20s. You know, do I want to have kids? Do I want to settle? Do I want to be in a relationship again? My relationship with God. So it's been a tricky but very kind of gratifying year. Would Just you, to find me. Sure. Would you say this era of entering a space where you're finding yourself you're finding yourself more off camera and you're just now sharing highlights on camera. Yeah, I think that's also another element. When I kind of propelled on YouTube, it was a lot of sharing my personal stuff, things sure. that I didn't realize at any point would come back to bite me in the behind. But now that there are so many elements of my personal life that are on social media, now I realize the importance of privacy and keeping some things private. Like, you know, my birthday, I no longer do like vlogs and stuff. There are certain elements with my friendships with people where I like to keep that moment as my own so that I don't bring a lot of criticism, a lot of, 
I don't know how to explain it without sounding like I'm saying stay out of my life. Mm-hmm. But certain parts of my life, I've realized how much I appreciate them being private and just allowing me to be myself in that moment. Yeah. You know? Have have you lost fake people and gained fewer real people in that process? And have you been intentional about doing that? So it's funny because I was actually filming a vlog on my way here. And one of the things that I spoke about is that this year I have lost a, f- a few people, people that I obviously realized weren't crucial to my personal growth, which is fine. But the people that I've gained, every single one of them has emphasized the importance of prayer and God. Like every single conversation I have with my loved ones, it's very like God focused now. And I didn't know how much I needed that element sure. in my life. I didn't know how much I needed friends who would bring me back to, you know, prayer, to really trusting more in my faith and not allowing, you know, negative thoughts to get the best of me. I mean, I would stay on calls with my friends for hours and I would tell them, this is where my mental is at. It's, you know, deteriorating. And a lot of my friends, some included in this room, not going to mention names, <laughs> would always tell me, pray. Yeah. So I think that's been the highlight of the friendships that I've really kind of garnered this year. Yeah. The power of prayer and the power of sticking together and the power of faith. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's been mm-hmm. the most rewarding part about my relationships this year. Yeah. 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 Just finding God in very small but big ways. Are you not um, feeling scared that by you saying this on this platform mm-hmm. that you've been able to center yourself this year Um, find alignment with who you are Mm -hmm. because I know that sometimes when we speak of God that it scares people because it sounds like this thing that is in far reach that is the spiritual concept but for (laughs) me God is just being centered with yourself it's going back to who you are Mm -hmm. and living a life that is more towards peace I don't think obviously you can be fully at peace every day of your life. There there are challenges, there are circumstances, Mm -hmm. but it's just operating from a pace of more peace, even when you are going through challenges. Would you say you are there where your approach towards, towards challenges is much calmer? No. So a little bit of a background about me. I went to a Catholic school for 30 years. So the whole idea of religion was embedded in my upbringing, okay. right? In my schooling career. I went to school, I prayed, I came home, I prayed. My parents are Catholics. I went to a Catholic church every Sunday. So my idea of religion was more so centered around my circumstance, what I grew up around, meaning that I praised God because my parents praised God. I praised God because at school we praised God. So I didn't really fully understand what I was doing. And even with the challenges that would come up it wouldn't be my first um, point of route. call. Yes, yeah. it wouldn't be my first point of call yeah. because it's like that's just something I was taught. Absolutely. Not necessarily something I decided to take that journey on, right? So the past two years, I think, were so tough on me to a point where I really had no other option than to just pray it out, cry it out, and I felt lighter. Yeah. So the thing about it is, or the thing that I've learned is that there's always been this element of faith and religion and prayer that I've never swayed away from, but I just never really um, poured into that I hear you. and allowed I hear myself you. to just really understand why am I praying? Why am I closing my eyes? What do I feel like God is to me? What is my relationship with God? And the truth is I didn't have one. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. You've, yeah. Moved, you've moved from religion to relationship. Yes, it's no longer just, oh, in the name of the Father, Son, Lord. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now it's, in the name of the Father, God, I need you. Yeah. It's, God, thank you. Thank you for a roof over my head. Thank you for all the things that I never thanked you for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, nigga, help me. <laughs> <laughs> so it moves from, I start off with gratitude. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. these past few years have been tough on so many people. So many people have lost their jobs. So many people have lost like their financial security. Yeah, yeah. And I've been comfortable enough to Remain. gain that and even throughout gain the period of COVID, yeah, right? Yeah. And I didn't thank him for that. Just that one change, something that has torn up so many individuals, for me, propelled me. And I never said thank you. Would you say now that you are building a relationship with God, you're able to even have gratitude that goes to a place of saying, wow, God, 
I was not pouring into a relationship and you were still carrying me. That's the thing. And don't you think sometimes when you realize how good your life has been that you feel the guilt for not saying thank you? Yeah. Because I'm one yeah. of those people who was taught, hi guys, how are you? Like I greet everybody in a room and I always say thank you, please. But then I think about it. I don't know who made this comment towards me, but maybe whoever watches this podcast, they were like, okay, so you trust like a driver when you get in the car. You trust them to keep you alive, right? Get onto an airplane. You trust the pilot to keep you alive. So why don't you trust the fact that God is the pilot of your life? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. well, that's an actually very accurate description. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just then kind of remember that every single time I was in a point of, you know, despair or where I felt like my life was just disruptive or there was a little bit of destruction around me. I was like, okay, this is all happening for a reason. And I'm going to get to where I'm going. I'm going to figure it out. God has got me at this point moving forward. So yeah, things are a little bit different. I'm not the temperamental, pessimistic, kind of agitated person that I used mm, to be. Mm, mm. A lot has changed. Why do you think there's so much backlash towards, especially um, young black female content creators who are now becoming more centered? Mm. Because I don't want to say religious, that's wrong. Yeah, yeah. It's, you guys are becoming centered and yeah. you're growing your relationship. Why do you think there's so much backlash towards that? I think it's because, and I'll be super blunt when I say this, um, people don't want to believe that people can change, right? Like, uh, for example, me. I was always loud. I would always tell my stories about, you know, my ex-boyfriends and stuff like that. And then if I would wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I've decided to be a nun, it goes against everything that people had known and had grown to understand about me from their perception. Mm -hmm. So the thing about it is that as content creators and looking back on it now, I'm so glad that I made the decisions that I made is that a lot of the time, we don't want to forgive people for their mistakes. And the thing about social media is that it's a digital footprint. So the things that you said three years ago are things that will kind of carry with you the higher you go up the ranks, right? So with black female content creators, we suffer a lot at the mercy of that, at the mistakes that we made. Like I've seen people kind of transcend into this very spiritual being of themselves. And initially, I was also just like, I bo. Well, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I came my fundies. <laughs> and then it happened to me. Yeah. Where God took away all, most of my friends, God took away boyfriends. Yeah. God took away like anything that I could, anything that I deemed important to me and just put me in a state of isolation. Mm. I was alone. Yeah. yeah. I had no other choice than to cry every single day and to a point where. I then started reflecting, why do you need all these things? Sure. You know? So I get the backlash that content creators face, especially female content creators, especially when they move towards this whole godly element, because a lot of the time people will do things that go against everything that they say about, you know, this godly element. Like we see how content creators move a lot of the time in these spaces, or maybe some of the things that they've done in the past mm, come back mm, to bite mm. them. But I don't think it's something we should be punishing people for. Sure. If people want to change, they should be given the freedom to do so. Myself too. I find myself constantly, I've spoken about God before on my channel, but it was from a very frivolous point of view. On the really outside, yeah. yeah. So we're like, yeah, born again, yeah, born. <laughs> but now I kind of value what I'm building. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I value the relationship. I understand my religion. I understand when I go to God, what, what I'm creating and what I'm building and what I'm establishing with this person, this this figure, like of my imagination, which is actually not my imagination, but still quite jokey about it though, if you can tell. <laughs> uh, something that happens though, um, I've seen in my own life, mm -hmm. when, when you do seek God more, mm -hmm. is that you do lose relationships. Yes. Some that you didn't plan on losing that you'd never thought you'd ever lose. you um, because you're Nitin Manji, you've got alignment and discernment. Exactly. You see certain things about people. Yeah. But there are some that you lose because the other person actually has discernment and you were not good for them. Oof. Um, and in my in my journey too, I've had to take myself to the red table and and say apologies. Have you been yeah. able to say apologies to people that you lost where when you reflect you were wrong? 
It's funny because um, there was someone in my life actually that I had reached out to wanting to apologize to because I think he met me at a point in my life where there was still a lot of growing up that I needed to do. There was still a lot of toy mill around me and he was my peace, he was my solace, but I don't think I was his. If anything, I think um, I loved him and he knows that I loved him. However, I quickly spiraled and I didn't even allow him to, you know, be there for me. I just spiraled and I went into a corner and there are certain elements of my behavior that I regret till this day. So I do feel like looking back at it, I I was volatile to certain people that may have not deserved it. And I've done my fair share of an apology to her, but there is one more person that I think deserves that from me. Mm-hmm. And I've reached out to him, so it, it, it will happen. Just won't tell you who. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting a sense that um, these people who you have apologized to and you're still yet to apologize to are people in your private life. Mm. Um, you have also in 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 the recent years definitely not recently because mm-hmm. as you're saying you're in a different journey and you've worked so hard to heal yeah um you've also had public fallouts Oof. are there also elements there where you wish things could have played out differently of course of course um you know in hindsight there are certain fallouts especially the public ones but i've only mentioned i've been very specific about one there was a friendship with one person that I really did value. And as much as, you know, the decision-making from both, you know, his end and mine could have been very uh, juvenile at the time, how things played out. It was the element of friendship that I lost, which meant a lot to me. So looking back at it, do I wish I had done things differently? No, no. There was nothing I could have potentially done differently that would have put me in a different place because everything I did was definitely out of, you know, a good heart and I was coming from a good place. I wasn't ever doing anything strategically when it came to the friendships that I created from a social media perspective. So the public fallout um, is only one person where I wish things could have played out differently with him. But the other public fallout, I think it, it happened, it hurt me, and I've made peace with them. And I never want to find myself in any space where my private life or my feelings and my emotions are now put on display for people to criticize and have opinions about. I I really don't want to engage in anything that brings any sort of disruptive energy in my life. I'm even thinking of leaving Twitter. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> because you are saying to me that there are certain platforms mm-hmm. that display your vulnerability so much exactly. for views yeah. and you're like, that's not me anymore. That's really not me. I, I know like <laughs> there's actually one person. It was quite it was quite funny at the time, but they called me Naledi Dikenedi Malela, right? Because I, I'm a crier. Mm-hmm. Like that's just who I am. Like even I get angry, I get happy, I will cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, you get to a point where when you're starting to be ridiculed for things about yourself that you can't change. Um, I know that Twitter is a platform that I've definitely seen the harsh side of it. And the reason why I never used to say anything was because at some point I was contributing to that negative space until I became the target. Mm-hmm. In the sense that we are sitting and we are watching other people being ridiculed and made fun of and we're laughing. And I say we because I'm saying obviously the general consensus when you are on the other side of the firing line, you're laughing, you're cackling, you're basically promoting this very, um, you know, toxic behavior until you are then at the mercy of people doing that to you. And that's what my career has done. It's put me in the firing line more times than I'd like to, you know, admit. And it just made me realize that, as a matter of fact, this is not cool. I've never been a fan of bullying. Like, I've never been someone who enjoys going at people. But also in the same breath, I've never, I can admit that at points where other people were being ill-treated, I could have stood up and said, you know, I could have been the exception. I could have not said anything. But at times when you are in a toxic space and you're all kind of toxic bonding. You join into the mob mentality. all into that mob mentality. So I don't know. I think 
Twitter is the one platform where I have the most followers because I'm a talker. So I tweet and I tweet jokes and I'm all about it and I go. But it's the one platform that I in that I least enjoy. Is that the right English term? Has Twitter the least? has Twitter contributed to uh, to some extent breaking you? Yeah. De- oh, most definitely. No other platform has de yo, you know when they decompartmentalize you, when they break you down to such a point when you're just like, but guys, really? Really? <laughs> yo, Twitter has has taken me down. Look, I I'm I'm someone with thick skin. So for me, you can say I'm ugly, you can say I'm not a 10. That doesn't really bother me. What bothers me is when you come for my character. What bothers me is when you say things about me like, oh, I'm this and I'm that, and you don't even know me. You know, you're going off of it because of your disdain for me. That's when things start to become really, really hurtful. The whole topical stuff about my looks, I've never really felt the full effects of that. I've never really cared. But it was when it came down to what people, their perception of my character, that's when it started to hurt because it was like, you don't even know me personally. You just dislike me because you like the other person in question. And so to come for my character, that, oof, I'm still having a hard time adjusting to that. I don't know how celebrities do it because it is tough. Have you ever been at a point where you even reconsidered your entire career because of what is being said about you on Twitter? Yes and no. <laughs> yes, because there was a point where I wanted to quit YouTube. And it was around the time where my ex-boyfriend that I've so- spoken about was really kind of putting me through a lot. And I used YouTube as a platform to trivialize the trauma that I had been exposed to. So I would tell story times about it. I would joke about it. But the reality is what he had done to me was so it was so traumatic and it was such a painful experience to me that I really was suicidal. And the only thing keeping me together were the people who were supporting me at that time. So there were points where I really wanted to give up on my career. It was around the time I was dating him. I constantly woke up to something new being exposed about him and, you know, the pain that I experienced. So to be a content creator and to be at the mercy of strangers because of your private affairs and there's nothing you can do about it is it's like a deafening silence it's like walking around naked and everywhere you go people know that oh this is this person's girlfriend and this is what they did to him and he did this and this and this and this and this Mm. it was it was it was something I needed to go to therapy for. And I only sure. realized it this year, that I needed to go to therapy for it because I was masking the jokes and the whole stuff. I was masking the trauma that was just laying dormant. So for a long time, you are a Lady M, but they'd give you a new surname, so-and-so's ex-girlfriend. Exactly. I was, I was so-and-so's ex-girlfriend for years. Like there was a point where people knew nothing about me. They just sure. knew of me being associated with them. So it was a case of, those who knew me would stick up for me because everybody just obviously thought, oh, um, it's a money-related thing. She's with him for the money, da 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 And that's just obviously the trivial stuff. But I think, excuse me, if I don't sneeze this out. One, two, three, we're not sneezing. Okay, we're, we're not, okay. <laughs> we're not sneezing. Okay. <laughs> so it was traumatic, but I was known as his girlfriend for years and I was okay with that because... Like you I said, loved him. I loved him. Yeah. I wanted to give, like, I didn't mind. He was always out there and I was always happy being beside him and behind him. But my aspect of content creation was always my personal getaway, my personal peace, my personal platform. When he met me, I was on YouTube. I was doing that stuff. It just started affecting me when my career kind of shot up. And all that other stuff that people didn't know were associated with me started coming back on some, you're the one who got cheated on and they did this and this and this Mm -hmm, and this. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's when it started becoming painful because I couldn't disassociate from that. It took me years to disassociate from him completely. Would you, reflecting uh, as uh, as a woman who's getting more mature now Mm. and who who knows more of what she wants, would you say... um, 
the importance of choosing the right partner is everything. Oh, yes. And the importance of just being an individual in a relationship. Okay. I had a very naive outlook okay. where I was happy to just dive into my partner and I felt like I was nothing without him. And, you know, I didn't really want to be anything outside of his partner. Now, I love my alone time. I love the individual, have your friends, I'll have mine. I used to kind of really join everything together. I wanted everything to mesh together because I always wanted to be with them. But now I appreciate the alone time that I get. I appreciate going out with people that are my friends and letting him have his life and I have my own. And also keeping our relationship private. I think that's been the most rewarding part that nobody knows about like my personal life because everybody used to know about it. It was a topic of conversation for mm. a long time. Yeah. So now... Things are different. Yeah, I get to be yeah. Naledi without a man being associated so, with it. Yeah, and it's yeah. cool. I love that. I want to speak about family mm -hmm. um, a bit. You are very close with your dad and you are very mm -hmm. vocal about that. Mm -hmm. your, your dad is your hero. Yes, he is. Your dad is your rock. And it's not many black girls whom their dad is their rock. What is the significance of having a dad who's so present that you realize that I am who I am because of this man. That one is tough and it actually makes me emotional. I would never, would have never become half the woman I was without that man, right? And I've spoken about it on the channel that they got divorced when I was young and, you know, I didn't grow up in a two-parent household. So you need to understand that growing up with my mom and then my mom passing away from such a young age and me having to live with someone I regarded a stranger. I, I saw him every weekend. He was a present dad. I always got the latest phones and I was just a cool girl at school. But it was the emotional connection element yeah. of my father that I had to build. Now, I wish, and I need people to understand this, our relationship was very rocky at first because we're the same. My dad is tough. And he's made me this tough woman with a tough exterior where at times I, I used to lack a lot of emotional um, intelligence, intelligence yeah. where I couldn't approach a situation with a calm tone or I, I didn't kind of nurse that femininity in me because I had a hard, staunch father who, had, who lived with me at my teens, a very crucial point where I needed a mom. And my dad had to be my dad and my mom. Mm -hmm. And as difficult as that was for him and for me, I don't blame him because I wouldn't be the strong woman that I was, the driven woman that I was, if I didn't experience some of that tough love, you know? Um, sorry, guys, I was getting a bit emotional there for a second. Um, but um, I think having a father who was that present in my life generally shaped how I think. Like, when my mom was still alive, I was number 20 at school. I didn't care about things. I hear you, yeah. When I lived with my dad, he's a perfectionist. He's a winner. Like, he doesn't understand losing. And as tough as that is, that mentality, I realized right from living with him how much I also was driven and how much I always wanted to win. And when I did something really well, he was, like, so happy for me and... We just shared the same emotions at the same time. And I lived with my dad for two years, from grade 10 to matric. I lived with my mom my whole life. From grade 10, I moved all the way from like position number 25, 27 to one in two years from living with my dad. I became so focused, yeah. so driven, so passionate about everything I put my, my heart and soul into that I realized that, yep, and the hyper-independence it's a, bit, it's a bit of a trauma experience, but my dad always reminded me that I want you to be independent. I never want you to need anybody else outside of your loved ones. Yeah, yeah. Don't ever find yourself at the mercy of a man. Don't ever find yourself at the mercy of anyone because that's when people will take advantage of that. And I don't know. It's, it was a tough lesson. I, I hear you. Um, that toughness, though, uh, I'm sure your dad tried to bring in a level of softness by introducing perhaps women that he'd identified that 
could be good enough to play the role of a mother, obviously not replace your mother. Of course. Um, and he tried to introduce that softly, mm. obviously, um, gradually. Mm. Um, but then that also didn't always work out. How did you navigate that too now, seeing your dad being hurt by marriages that he was mm. trying? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. Um, my dad is generally a lover and a giver. Like he is someone who gives a lot of himself and that's where the similarities come in and obviously people's relationships can be very different and when I was younger it was difficult navigating it because another woman can never love you the same as your own parent mm. and your own mom mm. and stuff so I can understand whatever he experienced from his private life and his relationships they are also weren't easy on us sometimes you build a relationship with someone and then they end and you now have to learn to live without those people in your life and that's occurred for me in the past but the beautiful thing about all of that is that my brothers and sisters even though we have different moms and stuff we are so close and we're so mm. tight-knit to a point where even my brother's mom is my mom yeah i have a good relationship with those people so i think the older I become, the more I realize how difficult navigating relationships is. So sure. I've had my fair share of failures in relationships. And now that my dad and I can speak and I hear where he's coming from and what he struggles with as an individual, as a father, as a husband, I feel more sympathy and empathy towards him. Yeah. And I learn to understand why he's made the decisions he's made. But he is a brilliant father. Ah. Oh, that man. Ah, that's my hero. Yeah. I'm gonna stick beside him through and through. He drives me up the wall though. We fight like cats and dogs. But that is my rider. That's my best friend. Now, lady, with popularity comes not just criticism, mm -hmm. but it comes with people who have ill intentions yes. getting into your life, not for the right reasons. Mm hmm. They're attracted by the popularity, the numbers, the fame, or they have their own personal agendas. They either want to plug in to the fame as well, okay. social climb, um, or they just want money, or they just want association, whatever the reason that mm -hmm. people may come in with. Um, in your romantic relationships, don't you find that your partners struggle with separating the role Naledi M versus Naledi M the person. They do. Um, I think that has been the biggest obstacle for me, navigating what people's intentions are now. Um, you know, you walk into things with a pure heart. I've never been someone who's been guarded and very like suspicious. I'm pessimistic. I always expect the worst, but I go in with a very open, hopeful heart. Uh, I treat everybody the same. So... I've had a fair share of people come into my life with ill intentions. I've had a fair share of being naive when I'm being told that, no man, this person isn't really here for the right reasons. And I'm like, no, you don't know him like I do. Yeah. You don't know her. Yeah. And that has put strain on maybe to a certain degree, some of my personal romantic relationships where my partners will feel as though, mm, I think you need to walk in this with a little bit more, like you need to be a little bit more level-headed about this friendship or level-headed about this business opportunity or be a little bit more open-minded when you go into it and not be, you know, like feathers and roses and daisies because I'm genuinely like, you know, wide-eyed and I just came to Chobik. <laughs> I grew up in Chobik, never mind. <laughs> but I realize now more than ever, I've had a fair share of people maybe, you know, come into my life and not come in with the right intentions. But I know better now than I did a few years ago. And I am grateful because some partners did alert me. Some of my romantic partners have helped me disassociate. Okay. Yeah. Some of them have definitely seen the rough side of social media yeah. and what it's done to me behind closed doors. And they had to pick up those pieces. So I'm grateful I am, especially um, my recent exes. I think they really suffered the brunt of my career because mm -hmm. they dated me at what I would have considered the peak of my career. Have you ever wished that you could unfame yourself for a relationship to survive? No. 
No, 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 no. I wouldn't unfame myself for relationships as five. I would unfame myself to have the old me back. This new me is great. I mean, I've lost weight. You know, I can do my makeup great. I go into like a restaurant. Sometimes I go, oh, we'll get you a table. And I'm like, you know, but I would unfame myself to have the old me back because the new me comes with God. The new me comes with suspicion. The new me comes with, I don't know what your intentions are, so I'm going to keep you at arm's length. And some people could really just be good people. Sure. But I can't tell anymore. Everybody's met mm. with the same level of suspicion. Mm. Everybody's met with the same level of side eye, you know? So I, I would unfame myself just to remember what the old Naledi had because that Naledi had some of the best times of her life. She had the best years of her life. Now I watch where I am. I watch what I'm drinking. I watch who's looking at me. I watch that I'm not doing anything wrong. Even when I'm having a bad day, I have to smile if someone goes, Naledi! So it's tough. The, a part of me is gone. Maybe, maybe she's not gone. She's just somewhere deep down in the shadows. It's a sacrifice you just have to bear with when you're in this game. It's a sacrifice I didn't realize I was making. Sure. But now that I'm here, yeah. it's a sacrifice yeah. that I actively, subconsciously made without yeah. realizing it. On, on that subject of sacrifices, um, what do you think is the biggest sacrifice? Or rather, what is the biggest pain you think you've gone through, especially in the past three years? Wolf. I think they... Oh, the biggest pain I've gone through, and this is a tough question because a lot of the time I center my pain around my loved ones, but the biggest pain I've had to go through was to actually accept that my mental health was taking a toll, to deal with the imposter syndrome, to deal with the traumas I thought I dealt with, to accept and fully accept that my mother is gone. She is not coming back. Like, even though these years have been so difficult, you know, sometimes when you just have so much regret about the things that you didn't do when this person was alive. But I had even more regret because I was young. What was I going to do at that time for her? My sister got the best years of my mom and I got nothing. I got, I was an unruly teenager. And now that I'm at this point, and I know that she's obviously guiding me from that perspective, I had a lot of guilt about why couldn't God have just given me more time, more time to try to, to, try. to be good, to be the good child, you know? Yeah. Um, my dad got the best years of me, but my mom is the reason that I am half the woman that I am. Yeah. You know, she raised me. She lived with me at the worst ages of my life. And my dad then came in, swooped up, and then just put a little bit of like hard love. And then he got the best kid. Now he's going to his friends. Yeah, my my, my child, the lady's on channel. <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 no. You know? So it's it's tough, man. It's I know how. I would have loved for my mom to be here because I know she would have shouted it from the hilltops. But yeah. I guess I am my mom's work. Mm. They see me, they see my mom, and, you know, her legacy will always live on through me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's a beautiful legacy that, that you're building. Painful one, though. Yeah. It stayed a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. Could have yeah. waited until I was 21. Something. <laughs> but it's fine. I am who I am because of her. It, it's interesting that something that happened so long ago still yeah. affected your mental health. Mm -hmm. And it is something that you had to face within your mental health very yeah. recently. Yeah. And haven't you noticed that it's always the things that happen to us as kids. Yeah. When we're like in our mid-20s, it's just like, actually, that hurt me. <laughs> I need to deal with this. And it shapes your life. Like you move in a very different way. You... There was a point where I thought I forgot the sound of her voice. And I hated myself. I had so much self-hatred. I was like, 
And there are moments where I win an award and I just want to feel the hug mm -hmm. of that lady. Like, I just want to remember what she smelled like, what she felt like, you know. So I don't know. It's it's always the things that we experience, especially in the foundation years, that will come back and kind of shape who you are now. If you were raised in a loving home, even if it wasn't a two-parent household, my mom was remembered because she was loved by the whole community. Imza, most played view. They loved my mom. And I've gotten to a place where I have strangers who will come up to me and say, you remind me of your mom. Mm. You were so giving. You're so selfless. And I'm like, you know what? It's funny because my mom was the selfless person. And if I didn't grow up in an environment with a loving mom who was like this to other people, I don't think I'd be the person that I was now. So, yeah, they do affect you. Um, everything that happens in your foundation years shapes who you become. Yeah, yeah. And also the traumas that you experience, how you navigate them also shape who you become. If you live in a lot of anger, in a lot of resentment, you will embody that in your everyday life. I lived with a lot of pain and I lived with a lot of guilt. So everything I did, I felt I needed to apologize. It was from a place of pain. It was from guilt. a place of pain. Yeah. A place of guilt, a place of sorrow, yeah. deep rooted sorrow. Yeah. So yeah, I I constantly I don't know what it is and I don't know if it's a telepathy thing, but you know when you sit with someone who's experienced the pain that you have and you feel like you can pick it up in the sound of their voice and you just feel so much empathy. People who grew up with a lot of pain and sorrow exhibit a lot of empathy. People who grew up with a lot of resentment exhibit a lot of anger. People who grow up with a lot of loneliness exhibit isolation. What they regard as solitude, they don't let anybody in. It's a result of your circumstance. So it's it's funny how life works, isn't it? You get a lot of flack on social media for being a inverted commas rich kid. Whoa! <laughs> um, so that is an assumption that life is easy for you because yeah. everything is done for you. Mm -hmm. I've got a feeling that some people probably think you have bodyguards and you have just <laughs> a, a plethora of staff members that look after you and take care of your life. Um, whether it tr it's true or not, mm -hmm. which you're going to clarify now, um, I think it's fair that we've had this conversation and for a person who's been watching ever since we started um, talking is that Look at how many challenges a person you perceive that way yeah, goes, through. goes through. And those challenges are very nuanced. Mm. They might not be as basic and fundamental as not having food. Of course. But, but the nuance of those challenges can also lead to a person wanting to die. Exactly. And, and you know, um, I think I had started shutting out the fact that in situations like that, I can't engage because my feelings completely get negated by the fact that I grew up comfortably, you know. Um, I was labeled like that for a long time. My dad worked extremely hard. Um, he was a prison father. He was loving. He was selfless. And he loved my mother. Oh, completely, irrevocably. And loved her. Built her a house. And, and, you know, we lived comfortably. Even though their marriage didn't work out, he never, never, ever turned his back on her. So... I never spoke about that because the one thing I was taught was humility. Everything that I have is on mine. It's actually his. But this is just the start to build your future, mm, mm, right? Mm. And I'm grateful for the comfortable element that I grew up in. But it was also the challenges of feeling like alone and growing up as a child who was considered unruly, which I was. Let me not lie. Not lie. But um, I grew up and I was very angry as a child because, you know, I was compared to my sister who was a golden child. So I grew up constantly kind of, you know, what's the word? I want to use the word of someone who always wants to shout, who always wants to, you want to be loved, but the only way you can do that is by doing things. Attention that will, seeking? Yeah, man. It was giving attention seeking. I was yeah, always getting in trouble yeah, at school. Yeah. I was always, you know, getting into the principal's office and the comparison to my sister, I even remember in my journals, I still have them. I wrote them down and I wrote one line that actually hurt me. I was like, I think my parents love my sister more than they love me. Mm. And that angered me. So you grow up and 
you kind of shut out to all the emotional stuff and you you become I don't know what they call in your teenage years you just get through that teenage thing where you just want to break the rules and you want to do your own thing but what people need to understand is that I've never once assumed or lived in a place of entitlement you know I've never you know lived as per what I love. I've mm. always kept my private life private because I always believe that that has nothing to do with me. So when I go onto YouTube, I talk about the things that are in my capability. I will never sit and say, you know what, guys, I think you should all buy, you know, Jaguars and stuff. I can't even, you know, what, what, what do you, you know, I, I feel like because I was raised by a father who was very stern in saying that you will build your future, we were always aware of the fact that we only live this comfortable life to aid us, not because we are entitled sure. to what our parents have done. No, that was never the case. So because people started, obviously, from a social media thing, kind of, you know, digging and seeing and it being exposed to, oh, so they live like this. It's a case of them associating me with that. And that's not who I am at all. That's not who I am at all. If you watch my content, if you see the stuff that I do, I am very transparent about how my dad feels about money and how my dad feels about raising us and how my dad feels about certain things. I'm very transparent about that. I don't want to lie about that. I could easily lie and say, yeah, everything we love is so cool and calm and collected and things are great, but they're not. I have no access to what people think I have access to. All the money I make is the money I make by myself. I've been honest about the fact that, yes, my parents have helped me in terms A, B, and C. And that's it. And it's it's tough to explain that to people because people will never see it that way. Mm, mm. People will always Speaking make Speaking from what, a position of privilege. Exactly. It's like, oh, you don't understand. You don't know yeah. what it's like. And it's kind of like, um, you're probably right. I don't understand. Yeah. But I've never, ever tried to put myself in a position where I felt like I wouldn't be able to sympathize. I can sit and understand why it's so tough to get money. Working by myself, building the Naledi M brand wasn't off the comfortability of my mm. parents' backs. That was all me. And people tend to forget that. I work. I put my life out there. I'm transparent about how much I make. I'm transparent about what it took to get me here. I'm transparent about starting YouTube in 2016 when people weren't even thinking of YouTube as a financial outcome. Mm, mm, mm. I was already there mentally. I was already moving in such a way where I wanted to get that out. I wanted to do something that I loved. I wanted to create a community. So I just wish people understood that I've never tried to, you know, kind of rally for something that I've never experienced. But I've also never wanted people to associate me with my parents and they, like my upbringing because that's not who I am. No, not at all. Um, we're nearing the end of our conversation. Oh, um, I know. I hope I don't talk too much. Simnand, yes. Simnand, yes. <laughs> um, you've just won two South African Social Media Awards for Beauty Influencer of the Year and social. South African Social Media Influencer, Influencer of, of the, the year. year. That's crazy, which means uh, the authorities that we have said that as an influencer countrywide, you are the Influencer of the Year. Oof crazy right i know um, when you say it like that it just sounds ah yeah like, oh yeah oh. which means you're doing extremely well i'm so proud of you, you. um I, I also acknowledge that you're in a transition phase i mean it, i think it's been very evident throughout our conversation mm -hmm. would you say you have clarity of where you're transitioning to yet yeah i finally think i now know what i was building without realizing it you know sometimes to build a house, you need an architect. You need someone who's going to check. You need, I don't know what else. You need, you need an engineer. You need someone who's going to build it. Someone's going to put the roofing. Someone's going to do whatever they're going to do. When I was building the Nelly M brand, I didn't know what I was building. Sure. I was just doing a series of different things that I loved. And to be affirmed this year, after having probably been in the space for about seven years, to be affirmed this year and say that, you are literally the social media influencer of the year. I was like, damn, that's what I was doing. <laughs> it came as a shock. It was like, I never wanted to associate with the term influencer. I always said digital content creator. But 
like I said, I was watching um, Michale's interview on Unfollowed and she was like, because to be a, an influencer is to change the consumer behavior, to affect that perception. And you know you've done that. And I've done that. Yeah. So yes, I am an influencer. So yes, I am deserving. The imposter syndrome comes when you believe you aren't deserving. Mm. I didn't know what I was building, so I didn't believe I deserved it. I was looking at the other people, Savala content creator, people who actually put in the work, they're cleaning their houses, handy, handy. Like things are just big. Like, like people are doing big things and are exceeding at a faster rate than me. Yeah. My, my journey was long. Yes. My journey consisted of a lot Gradual. of things that shut in my face. Yeah. My journey consisted of a lot of people who didn't really like my character or my personality. So to receive that, I don't even know how I can explain it. But what I will say is I am a social media influencer of the year and I'm a beauty influencer. So, yeah. And I did this makeup myself. <laughs> so, yes. It is you. It's all me. <laughs> I should be actually driving around with my awards, but hey, <laughs> they're quite heavy. Last yeah. but not least, um, what's the one thing in life you know for sure you're absolutely certain of? What's the one thing in life I know for sure? I know for sure that I am loved by my family and my friends. And I know for sure that I will forever give love. And that's it. That's all I know. I don't know what the future holds. Could be poor tomorrow, but I'll still give love. <laughs> Could be single till I'm 45, but I will still give love. And I know I will still receive love. My life right now is full of love. My cup is overjoyed like it's over overflowing with love the show is engineer your life and i'm lunga okay um, i hope that's the side of naledi m official that you weren't aware of but you've got to see a beautiful side to her a more vulnerable side a side that shows maturity a yeah. side that is well-rounded as she's saying you can see in her face you can see in her gestures that the cup is overflowing yeah. which means that with maturity there is love there is life there is healing there is purpose i hope you continue enjoying our episodes don't forget to subscribe don't forget to like and of course subscribe on the lady's channel it's the lady malela yes yes you'll find her there i mean of course youtube she owns these streets wow friend i think you should be a motivational speaker Thank why you so are much. you changing my life you feel changed are you like more mature more i'm like <laughs> right. thank you so much for having me it's a show. pleasure it's a pleasure. Yeah. Hope to see you soon again. Definitely. Yes. Anytime. We'll be celebrating more and more bigger things, bigger shows. Yeah. Thank you so much. Introducing the epitome of luxury living, Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.